I, I, I argue that there are only six things that contribute to our quality of life, and they are all experiences. They're whether or not we have enough experiences that contribute to whether we feel happy, satisfied, functional, engaged, meaningful, and secure. Your mind can be your most valuable asset or your biggest liability, and you get to choose. This is the Building Psychological Strength Podcast, where we explore ways to build resilience, build confidence, and make our minds work in our favor. We draw from the fields of psychology and life design to help us intentionally create a rock-solid mindset upon which a vibrant life experience can be built. My name is April Seifert. I'm a psychologist, a life design strategist, and co-founder of Peak Mind, the Center for Psychological Strength. Each week, I'll introduce you to an expert, a concept, a technique, or a hands-on practice that will help you build psychological strength in your own life. These are the tools to help you thrive. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Building Psychological Strength Podcast. My name is April Seifert, and I'm your host. This week, we are speaking to somebody who I met through the most random circumstances. I'm not going to go through that here because we talk about it in his interview, but talk about a hysterical way to get connected to another amazing mind within the field of psychology. Today, we're talking to Dr. Kevin Payne. He is a scientist, an entrepreneur, and an author. We talk a lot about his upcoming book, Your Life Well Lived, presents a new understanding of what it's like to live with a chronic health condition, and it shows both people who are diagnosed and their caregivers how to improve quality of life. Now, something that's important here is that we're going to talk a lot about chronic conditions in this episode, but you'll hear it throughout. We keep making the point that All of the information in Kevin's book, everything we're talking about in this episode is basic, fundamental stuff that would help any human being, whether you have a chronic condition or not, anyone live a better life. So I'm excited to have Kevin on this episode. His book also relates his personal journey with multiple sclerosis. So you can see one commonality between Kevin and I. There are so many, and I'm excited uh, for you to hear about those. He also has a very innovative company called Chronic Cow, and it's a total labor of love for him. He uses cutting edge analytics to deliver improved quality of life. So these are practical answers that are grounded in science, driven by data and delivered with compassion and it's personalized for you. He talks a bit about this amazing recommendation engine that he built. So he's a data scientist too. Isn't that funny? Another commonality, but He built a recommendation engine to help you figure out what the best actions and the best uh, things that you can do to improve your life are. So you can actually go in and take this, uh, go through what looks like a survey and a recommendation engine will run in the background and figure out what your next step should be. Uh, Kevin has educated, inspired, and entertained tens of thousands through his classes, workshops, and speeches. He has a PhD in sociology and psychology, so he can not only crunch data, but he can also present it in a way that people can actually understand and implement. I'm so excited for you to hear from Kevin. He's had 15 years as a professor, and he ultimately left academia to pursue a life of serial entrepreneurship that is all focused around helping people live well. I'm so excited to have him on. This was such an incredible turn of events that we got connected, and I know you all are going to experience such a shift and get so much value out of this episode with Dr. Kevin Payne. Kevin, I'm so excited that you're here today. This is going to be awesome. Me too. Uh, we, we have so much to talk about that uh, I, I, my mind is a whirl. I know. I know. I think it's going to be tough to keep this one reined in. Uh, I feel like I need to be transparent about how we met with this audience because it is hysterical about how all this happened. Can you talk about how – because you – originally through some Google searching found me. What led you, like, what were you searching and how did you find me? <laughs> well, I was, I was uh, doing a, a magazine interview for uh, 
uh, that was about people who skydived with chronic illness. And afterward, I got curious and I thought, well, can I find other people with multiple sclerosis who skydive? So I did a search and there was a bunch of garbage. And uh, then I narrowed it to an image search. And I found pictures of people with multiple sclerosis doing tandem skydives. I found uh, people who were doing charity dives to support MS. And then I found pictures of me and pictures of you. <laughs> <laughs> so I followed the breadcrumbs and there you were. And uh, I was stunned. And the uncanniness, so you were stunned at that point, which is hysterical, because then you keep going, and it's uncanny how much the two of us have in common. So for folks who haven't listened to me for a while, I also have multiple sclerosis, have lived with it since I was about 14, and uh, have my skydive license as well. But then we... I think we chatted on the phone and we realized how much more we have in common. So do you want to keep going on the laundry list? Yeah. So, so we're both social psychologists uh, and, and, you know, have doctorates in that field. We both have done extensive work as data scientists. Uh, we both have podcasts. Um, and, and it just went on and on and on. And, and I felt like you were kind of the long lost sister from another mister. <laughs> I love it. And so we were chatting and as we had that conversation and we kind of got over the initial shock of how much we had in common, we got to talking about your area of expertise and the work that you do, your book and all of that. And I knew that I needed to bring you on uh, because I knew that this audience would really find a lot of value in the work that you're doing. So where's the best place to start? Is it your company? Should we start with your book? Where should we dive in today? Okay. So I spent a lot of years as a professor and, and left to be an entrepreneur. Another you know, similarity we have being entrepreneurs. Uh, and my life was completely turned upside down by living with a chronic illness, both as someone who was diagnosed and years spent as a caregiver. And it completely exploded my life. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm the wrong kind of doctor to find a medical cure. But there are so many things that we face that are non-medical that directly contribute to our quality of life. And, and that's the kind of doctor that I can speak to. So I, I radically shifted my research emphases, and that's the kind of the foundation of the company I've built and the book that's coming out here in December. Uh, so the company is called Chronic Cow. <laughs> and yeah, your, your listeners have heard that right, Chronic Cow. <laughs> and and the reason is, uh, long story very short, I lived in England in the early 90s uh, during the Mad Cow Scare. And so to this day, I can't donate blood. Mm, yeah, there's the question on the blood donation. Have you lived in England? And they give you a time frame. That's funny. That's right. Okay, got and, it. And so it became a running family joke that I would get variant Kirchfeld jacob disease, mad cow. And, you know, in poor taste, but still, it was funny, and it, and it was, you know, kept on. So when I was diagnosed with MS formally, after years of dealing with neurological weirdnesses about the edges, my kids were really little. So I came home, and I set everybody around the table and, and explained to them what had happened, and they were really quiet. And then one of them leaned over to the other and said, Daddy got the cow. <laughs> I love kids. That's hysterical. <laughs> exactly. So, so it became this kind of barometer. And, you know, my family would say when my symptoms were, were flaring up, they'd say, Daddy's cow is mad. And on a couple of mm. occasions, when, when the kids didn't think I could hear them, they, you know, I would hear them say, Daddy's cow is really pissed today. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that's so, so awesome yeah so so there's that personal story but then you know from from a, a broader perspective i named the company chronic cow because 
so many people that I have tried to help over the years have, you know, they, they, they live with this idea that there's a monster that's been dropped in their body with them. And they frame their lives as a constant fight. And if you frame your life as a fight against a monster, you will never win. So it's not a monster, it's a cow. She's big, she's bulky, she's smelly, she gets in the way, but you can handle a cow. Mm, that's amazing. That's amazing. Can you dive into that a little bit? I, it's, um, actually, before we go there, let me make one point. Mm -hmm. Something that we were talking about before we started recording is something that I want to make sure that I mention now. So much of what we do in Peak Mind and with the Building Psychological Strength podcast is we're drawing from the field of psychology, essentially a lot of stuff that happens during therapy and, you know, in peer-reviewed journal articles and things like that that are that were originally written and research that was originally done to help people who have, you know, diagnoses, mental health diagnoses of some sort. And sometimes it can be tough to make the make the connection between how that information that's meant to help somebody who has a diagnosis could help somebody just in their average life. Like this is not for just for people who have a very specific mental health diagnosis. The the techniques and the tools that we talk about on this podcast and in Peak Mind, they help everyone. And to your point, and more focused on your work, you know, you focus so much with people who have chronic illnesses and chronic conditions, which is extremely important work. But similarly, the work that you do with them, the tools and techniques that you give them, the reframing that you do and helping them think about it, so useful for everyone, even if you don't have a chronic condition. So if you're listening to this and you're like, eh, I don't know if this episode is really for me, the information in here applies no matter what your circumstances are. These are basic, hey, let's live a good life kinds of tools and techniques. Yeah, exactly. And and that's why the, the subtitle of my book is is about chronic distress, pain, and illness, because these are circumstances that we all live in. And, you know, half of all Americans like us now live with chronic health conditions. So if you don't have one, you care about someone who does. And that's equally as distressing. And, and, and so all of these tools, people like to frame themselves as either healthy or sick. And, and we throw ourselves into these stereotypes. And by stereotyping, when we're healthy, it makes us feel more comfortable about ourselves. But the problem is that, you know, without being too delicate here, most of us are not nearly as good at being people as we'd like to think. Mm, dive into that. I, I would love to hear the, the sub bullets under that because yeah. I think there's some good stuff there. They... Uh, we have a an inbuilt bias, which is is well understood through research, where we we see ourselves usually a little more positive than we should. We're, we're and there are a lot of good reasons for that because that is a source of resilience for us, and it keeps us motivated to keep trying in the face of failure, but. In surveys, 70, 80 percent of people will identify that they are above average. Well, that's impossible. <laughs> I mean, maybe not everyone is, but I definitely am. I'm just kidding. Well, Keep going. <laughs> I, I, I completely understand that, and that's because you and I are so similar. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Sorry. No, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, so, <clears throat> so I really, you know, like to focus on on this idea that. We set such high standards for ourselves sometimes that rather than acknowledge that, that we all are too human and fail all the time, uh, we, we reframe a, a fictional interpretation of that reality. And, and, and that makes us 
satisfied. It makes us happy uh, for a time, but it's still not true. And if if we learn to approach ourselves with a little more grace and kindness, uh, then we can face those those shortcomings, and we can really work to you know, often just accept them because we don't have to be great. We don't have to be perfect at everything. We, we need to, to give things a shot. We need to understand that, you know, in my book, I, I talk about this thing I call the, the edge. And the edge is where the capacity that we can deliver is approaching the demand of the circumstance in front of us. Mm. So it could be a physical task. It could be emotional, it could be cognitive, it could be social in a relationship. But, but all of these things have an edge. And, and when we get there, we're going to fail. Because, be, because the edge is, is where pain, fear, risk, and danger reside. But it's also where we're most truly alive. Mm-hmm. Joy, love, growth, and learning are also found there. And, and so when we get to that current limit of our abilities and experience, we should celebrate that because we're being brave enough to to tackle that edge. And that's where learning and strength and growth happen. I couldn't agree with that more. I'm standing over here like wanting to jump up and down and cheer and high five you through my computer. (laughs) Um, It's interesting because number one, I think people underestimate where that edge is because our natural inclination to be afraid and mitigate risk kicks in quickly as we start to approach the edges or even like think about approaching the edges of what our comfort zone is that fear response kicks in and we don't realize that we do have a bit more gas in the tank but without and, and without bumping up against that edge, which I love that terminology, without bumping up against that, as you mentioned, growth can't happen. You have mm-hmm. to get to the point where you've fatigued what you are capable of doing for your body to it, – it's like building a muscle, right? That's why exactly. we call this building psychological strength. It's a set of exercises very intentionally – um, using the analogy of physical exercise. This is mm-hmm. a muscle. I'd love to hear your perspective on this because I know you've written on this in your book. Yeah, and, and you're exactly right. I, I begin with that analogy because people can understand lifting weights, for example. They, they know that when we stress our muscles just a bit and then we relax and we allow ourselves the time and the resources to recover, we come back stronger. In the same way, if we do not cognitively stretch our boundaries in the same way, I mean, when you try to learn something new, you fail a lot. And and that's okay, because you're, you're learning, and, you know, people, people succeed once, and they think, woohoo, I've got it. And they forget that one sign that you are at an edge is that your performance becomes erratic. You succeed, you fail, you succeed, you fail, and, and, and you go about until you have developed enough that performance at that level is no longer at your edge, but mm-hmm. within your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. And I- we do that. Yeah, I mean, it's emotional. It's in relationships, too. I totally agree. I have an analogy, actually, that I, I, a better podcast host would just know the numbers of all of their episodes. I don't. I'm not that good. But a previous episode, I'll link it up in the show notes. I'll find it and link it up on on the show notes page. But I gave the analogy talking about this exact thing, like trying to stretch your comfort zone, where that learning happens. The analogy I gave was when I was a kid. I used to go skiing a lot, which is funny because I'm from North Dakota, but there actually was a hill that you could ski down. (laughs) So there was a hill big enough. Uh, And I was trying to get better. 
And I remember one day I was talking to one of the ski coaches out at this hill and I said, yeah, I'm really working on getting better and I'm trying to um, really improve this winter. And he asked me the most interesting question. He said, oh, great. How many times did you fall today? And I said, I I didn't fall today. And he's like, you're not going to get better that way. He said, you need to get yourself to the point where you're going on runs that there's a chance you're going to fall because that run is slightly harder than what you were able to do when you showed up here today. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, this guy's totally right. Falling doesn't mean you're failing. Falling doesn't mean you're bad at it. Falling means you're on a run that's a little bit harder and you're getting used to it. It just like slapped me in the face when I was a kid and it stuck with me ever since. Yeah. Falling means you are pushing your boundaries. And that's a good thing. Because if we're not growing, we're dying. Living organisms are like that. If we're not growing, we're dying. I love that. Life can be so much more than simply going to work and waiting for the weekend. But deep down, you already know that. You know that life can be so much more vibrant. You know you were made for more than just passively going through the motions. You know you can thrive, but to do that, you have to start from the inside out. And that is why I'm so excited to announce that for a limited time, we're offering you the opportunity to join us in the Peak Mind membership for only $1 for your first month. That's right, $1 to join us in the full Peak Mind membership. All you have to do to take advantage of this amazing offer is to visit us at www.peakmindpsychology.com, click on the membership, and enter the code THRIVE at checkout. Think about it. We all know what we need to do to keep our bodies strong, but what about our minds? What if you had the tools to build the psychological strength confidence and resilience to help you thrive at work, at home, and in the rest of your life? What if you made the commitment to living your life by design and not by default? All of this is possible. The goal of Peak Mind, the Center for Psychological Strength, is to help you build the mental toughness, flexibility, and resilience to thrive in your life. We draw from the fields of psychology and life design to help you intentionally create the vibrant life experience you know is possible. Through live online workshops, a 24-7 on-demand library, expert interviews, and monthly challenges, our members are building the psychological strength that it takes to thrive through life's ups and downs. And like I said, you can do it too. For a limited time, we're offering you the opportunity to join us for only $1 for your first month. Just visit www.peakmindpsychology.com, click on the membership, and enter the code THRIVE at checkout. Your mind can be your most valuable asset or your biggest liability, and you get to choose. So what choice are you making? Join us in the Peak Mind membership before this amazing offer goes away. I want to make sure we get the full title of your book in here because I don't think I've done a good job of doing that. Your full book is called Your Life Lived Well, The Science of Crafting a Good Life Under Chronic Distress, Pain, and Illness. So maybe we can kind of hit this from a couple of sides. Um, I'd love to focus for just a moment on people who have chronic illness, because you made an interesting mention before about how, you know, there is not a monster inside you that you're trying to fight. And you've done this work with people who have had, who have chronic conditions for so long. I'd love to hear your thoughts about, you know, what are those factors that help somebody who has a chronic condition, help them live well, um, knowing that they have a bit more Uh, to manage maybe in their day-to-day life. And you certainly are a great example of that. And, you know, I am as well skydiving when, you know, you have a neurological condition that adds some complexity to an already complex sport. So would love to hear thoughts on, you know, for folks listening who might have a chronic condition, things that they need to know that are in your book that could help them live well. Sure. Um, and, you know, skydiving is a perfect example of that sort of thing. And, and for me, that's where I found my edge, right? But that doesn't mean everybody needs to go that far out to find it. There are other things in my life that seem very normal that are edge experiences for me. And, and the first issue that, that people in these circumstances need to understand is that Your edge is wherever your edge is right now at this moment. And 
there's no shame in wherever that is. I know one of the things that that many people with chronic illnesses, myself included sometimes, find frustrating is that our edge is a lot further in than we than where we think it should be. Everybody else is normal, or I used to do this all the time, and now you can't. Well, you know, cognitively, that's not at our edge, but maybe behaviorally it is. Maybe we don't have the coordination uh, at this particular time, or maybe our, our, you know, we're dealing with so much pain or, or whatever it is. It's it, be, because to do something, you know, to engage in any action, it kind of has to pass through each of those gates. It's got to go through cognitive and emotional and behavioral and physical and often social gates. And so it may be something that's socially easy for you to do and cognitively easy for you to do, but emotionally you're at the edge. That's your bottleneck at that point. So we have to become more intentional and more purposeful and, and really develop the skills of observing ourselves. And we're not normally trained how to do that. Uh, you and I were trained how to do that because that was part of the kind of, of academic training mm-hmm. that we went through. Mm-hmm. But that's not a typical thing. We're, we're mostly on auto- autopilot as we move through life. And uh, so, so that's kind of where we begin often. Because most of the challenges, because I, I, I'm a data guy, I kind of went a little crazy uh, with this after I was diagnosed and, and really got into this research. I, I've interviewed hundreds. I surveyed thousands. I built a scraper that went out on the web and collected 2.23 million data points. I did meta-analyses across more than 7,000 studies on over 100 conditions. That is a little nuts, but awesome. And I'm excited to learn what you learned. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for doing that, by the way. <laughs> well, and I found nobody had done that across conditions because people tend to be blinded by the medical diagnosis. And so they look mm. at only people who have MS or only people who have depression or only people who have CP or only people who have, you know, whatever it is. And I was interested in what's the shared experience we have when something comes into our lives that we can't get away from that is somehow affecting or diminishing some of our capacities and is providing that ongoing, pervasive, repeated source of threat and trauma. And what I found was that, you know, 80% of our challenges didn't have diddly squat to do with the medical diagnosis. Mm. They had to do with condition management, behavioral change, mindset, threat management, relationships, and quality of life. Wow. That list right there makes the point that I was saying earlier how, sure, you're... and. I want to go in about eight directions. I'm getting excited and scattered and that happens. But it you can see from that list right there how applicable your work and you know the content of your book is to a person in there who might not even have a chronic condition. Those are basic things that we all do on a day-to-day basis mm-hmm. or should do. Yeah. It's just, and you know, what, what, one thing that I think is happening is all of those are shared challenges everybody faces, but when we get that diagnosis, those are, those are kind of thrown into sharp relief in our lives, and they become more effortful in some ways, and, and we're more cognizant of how they're more effortful, but they're still true of everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I recently interviewed Isaac Lidsky. He wrote the book, uh, Eyes Wide Open, Ted Speaker, Crazy Resume, Childhood TV Star, Uh, but he's blind. And he makes a very similar point about how, um, you know, when you get diagnosed with something or when something happens to you, 
it's really easy to point at that thing and have that thing be the reason why, oh, you know what, I probably can't do this other thing or I probably can't try or I probably won't live the life that the the vibrant life that I want to live because I have this diagnosis or this thing happened to me. And you know, he's the first to admit being blind. So his he and his wife have triplets. Triplet babies came home to their house. <laughs> uh let's all take a moment of silence for them. Only um, one at a time. Oh man, goodness. I know. But um and that's that's a challenge. Triplets are a challenge in and of themselves. But having triplets when you can't see is another challenge. And he'll fully admit it is harder for him than another person. But he also said, I had to make a decision that doing this was important to me. Maybe I have to do it differently. Maybe I'm not going to do it in the same way or as perfectly as somebody else. But being involved is important to me. And those values and the things that we care about, really what we're getting at here, it's underlying desires of being a human being. And that's why I, I would argue the diagnosis doesn't matter or the fact that you have a diagnosis doesn't matter. The fact that you're human with a mind that evolved in the way that our minds did and works in the way that it does in this modern world, that means all this stuff applies to you. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, quality of life was one of those things on, on my list that, of the challenges that we face. And digging into that just a little bit further, I, I, I argue that there are only six things that contribute to our quality of life. And they are all experiences. They're whether or not we have enough experiences that contribute to whether we feel happy, satisfied, functional, engaged, meaningful, and secure. And that's it. Consistently, if you interview people about what makes them feel good about their lives, they, they share that they're having enough experiences that fulfill those fundamental things. And, and they're not hierarchical. They, you know, which one is important to you or to me might differ. Uh, like for me, I, I, have a, I have a creepy high tolerance for risk. So the security stuff doesn't necessarily resonate as high with me. I mean, I need some, all of us need some, but the, but the one of those six that, that really resonate from, from my quality of life is the meaningful one. I, I really feel like I, I, I have this, this feeling I've been so fortunate in my life to, to be able to get a lot of education and to spend my life doing what I love studying people and trying to figure us out. And, and I feel like that incurs a burden to do something useful with it. And not a burden in a bad way, but, but you know, this is, this is something that, that I feel really compelled to do. You know, the Seligman, in a lot of his positive psych work, talks mm -hmm. about the, the notion of living well, right? And so many people focus on positive emotions, happiness, and joy. And that's right. where they stop. And he said, he makes this, this funny comparison because he said, if all that mattered was positive emotion, no one would ever have kids. Because mm -hmm. by far and away, this happens <laughs> after you, people who have kids and compared to people who don't, people who have kids have less positive emotion. But yes. where things balance out is on that meaning side. You're mm -hmm. contributing to something that is important and bigger than you. I think I was profoundly affected. I had a, a, a really unusual undergraduate program, and, and it started with two required seminars. And they were both on the question, what does it mean? You know, so first semester of freshman year, and, and they were weed out courses. And the idea was, what does it mean to live a good life? And one of the seminars was focused on ancient Greek thought, you know, classic Greek thought uh, about eudaimonia. 
what is the good life? And the other one was Renaissance and Reformation thought on that. And I have been stuck on that question for the rest of my life, you know, for 30 years now. I've been stuck on that question. What does it mean to live well? Have you come up with a working definition? Um, you know, for me, it goes back to those six things mm-hmm. that, that I was talking about. And it's, and it's not about money. It's not about superficial things. And that's, you know, one of the other challenges that we face. We, each of us has within us a society of mind. And so we've got lots of different voices in our heads. And some of those are really primal and they're really early. So what do I mean by that? By primal, I mean they they came along very early in our evolutionary course. And so those very early voices are, are somatic responses. They're about pain and pleasure. And then the ones that came along a little later were about emotional responses. And, and the, so they add a little bit of nuance there. The, each, each level then is, is tuned to parsing a different signal from the world. So then later on we developed, you know, higher order cognitive functions and so forth. Similarly, as, as individuals, we start off as little leaky globs. And, and, and we cry and we, and we coo and, and we learn that we can manipulate the world in different ways and, and get what we want and get, and get away from things that we don't want. And we build and we build and we build. Well, when we are overwhelmed or bored or distracted, those early and primal voices are the ones who are driving. And those are the voices that by their makeup, have a really short time frame and, uh, and a really superficial understanding of the world. They're looking for immediate things. And it's, it's only as we, get, as we get less overwhelmed or more engaged or more focused that our, our executive functions can kind of become engaged. And so often we, we, we do something that later on we think, well, that was kind of stupid. Well, it wasn't stupid in the moment because the part of you that was driving was someone, was a part that, that thought that was a really good idea, you know? That's an amazing way to, you mentioned earlier, give yourself a bit of grace and kindness Mm-hmm. It's it's like a recognition of the fact that you're human. Guess what? You're human. You have these instinctual emotional responses. To your point, they're stronger, louder, and more provocative when you're tired or distracted or overwhelmed or one of, you know, one of the above. You you aren't completely mm-hmm. on your game and we all you know, we all fall prey <laughs> to those urges and impulses and instincts just because we're human. That's one thing that makes us such a kooky little animal. <laughs> you know, we just, we have these um, these instincts that are very strong and they're very old and they just take over sometimes. Well, we do, we, there's no shame in admitting that we're just uppity animals that are trying to make sense of the world. That's a perfect way of describing it. That is so perfect. So... You know, for people who are listening to this, do you have some, um, I guess, some actionable, tangible things? Like if you could look at someone in the eye who's listening to this right now and almost prescribe something or a set of things for them to do that could, you know, make a near term difference that could help them live a better life. What are those few things? Like what would you go have people do to take away from the work that you've done? Well, I'll say two things here. One is that for each of us, the answers are different. And that's what my company does. Actually, I I developed a set of analytic models that that screen people to identify, uh, you know, this is the most likely thing you should do. Let me give you a concrete example. So somebody comes along and they 
you know, they, I, I said earlier that, that a lot of the challenges we face amount to behavioral change or mindset change. Well, there are 150 different ways to change a behavior. And all of those techniques work for someone, but only some of them will work for you. And the problem is that the way that we approach it normally is really haphazard. You know, your sister gives you one bit of advice, your, your hairdresser gives you another, your second cousin's, you know, uh, handyman says something else. And so we, we grasp at straws. What we need to understand is that a lot of these methods of behavioral change depend on personality traits, they depend on circumstances, they depend on things that we can identify and that if we, we know, we can be pointed toward. So one thing that I want to help people understand if they, if they feel as if they can't change, they can't make an improvement, that's not their fault. The, the problem is that there are a whole lot of different possibilities out there, and they just need to be connected with the right one. So you can think of it as a recommendation engine, mm, right? I love that. And and you know, so and I don't know anybody who's constructed a a recommendation engine and matching algorithms for behavioral and mindset change, and and so that's what the company does, uh, and then we use that to drive curricula that that we deliver. And, and suggestions and monitoring that, that go along with that. So, so that's one thing. But then the second thing that people can walk out with right now is you need to learn to recognize the, the signs of you being at the edge. And the beautiful thing about being at the edge is right below being at the edge is a flow experience. And those are some of the best experiences that we have as human beings. And, and those experiences can be framed as fear or they can be framed as excitement, right? So I don't know about you, but every time I jump out of an airplane, right before I hit the door, a little voice in the back of my head says, 82 seconds. Mm. And I know that my life expectancy is now 82 seconds unless I do something really right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's a wonderful thing that I love about jumping out of airplanes. People think you're either absolutely crazy or a total <laughs> if you do it, but what they don't realize is that's where we find joy because there's joy and freedom in the air for some of us. And I just want everybody to find their own place where they find their joy and their freedom. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so reframing every time you have a fear experience, that's that's invoking this whole set of threat responses that that we have that are primal, that are largely outside of our control. But what we can control is how we learn to frame them. So anymore, I don't get afraid when I jump out of the door, I get excited. I don't get afraid when I'm in front of a crowd. I get excited. And that takes time and that takes grace and that takes exposure and it takes practice and it takes failure and it takes getting mm. back up again. That's so good. That is so good. Um, I love all of that. I adore that you have a recommendation engine for people to figure out what their next best step is. Where do people get access to that? Where do they find you and that, that engine? And how do they get hooked up to something like that? If they go to chroniccal.com, uh, then they can sign up. And, and uh, right now, it's available in a couple of different ways. We, we do it through a human-mediated interface. Uh, they go in, and it looks like a survey, and they do that. And then they're assigned a chronic cow guide. And they kind of go through that process and, and it's available uh, through uh, in a group format and an individual format. Next year, the app is coming out uh, sometime in there. It's coming out as 
what will look like a, a, an online course format. So there's some of the analytics and then it's directed toward what they need. So one of the things that I found is uh, that's, that's a continual problem is there's a bunch of apps out there that purport to teach you or show you or guide you in a particular area. And again, all of them will work for someone, but only some of them will work for you. And, and the problem with a lot of them, you know, the dirty little secret of most apps is they don't have a lot of stickiness. People don't stay with them. And, and what the research tells us is that sometimes we need some human mediation. So rather than just coming out with an app, we've, we've got the chronic cow guides who are all trained as psychologists or social workers or therapists, you know, in some way, even though that's not what we're doing, that's the right skill set. And they all have personal experience as caregivers or living with I chronic love conditions themselves. That. Oh my gosh, I love that. It's so needed. You know, because, uh, again, mm -hmm. as someone with MS, right, I know exactly who to go to if I have um, an exacerbation or a flare-up or something happens physiologically. Um, my right. and So ha high five to my neurologist. You're awesome. But the rest of it, the surround, you know, the... Everything else that you talked about, the relationship parts and the risk assessment parts and like how to live life as a full person in spite of all of that happening, your only resource really is therapy right now. And I, I don't want people to ever think that I dog on therapy because I'm in it right now for, you know, another issue. You know, if you want to know more about that, uh, episode 143, I released a bonus episode with that, I dive into it a bit there. So if you really want to get to the heart of that, that's there. But there's, so there's nothing wrong with therapy, but that's not the right modality for people always, but it's the only one there is. And so that's the whole reason behind Peak Mind and high five to you for being another person out there who's trying to take these powerful tools and techniques and give them to people without making them jump through the hoops of getting their own PhD or, you know, going to therapy as their only option. I just adore that. That's so good. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank you. And, and you know, I've, I've been through therapy myself. I, I, there's, you know, it's, it's a beautiful tool for the right people in the right circumstance with the right insurance. And, you know, so don't even get me started on that. Uh, but there have to be other modes to do this. <clears throat> And one of the things that, that you mentioned, you know, you go to your neurologist and your neurologist is the person you have to go to for specific kinds of physical medical questions. But one of the challenges that, that we face is that your medical health professional becomes the face of the entire system when you have questions. And a whole lot of the questions that people with chronic illnesses and their loved ones and caregivers come to their medical professionals with are ones that are outside their expertise. And that makes them uncomfortable. And that contributes to stress and burnout in those professions. And so, you know, with Chronic Cal, a lot of what we do is, is seminars and webinars for medical mm. health and therapeutic professionals to help them deal with this and and give you know better quality answers and also deal with the stress of patients like you and I because like for me you know with me there is no happy ending i will never get better and medical professionals are trained in an acute care model they're trained with this idea that people come in, they have a problem, you fix it, you return them to their normal life. And subconsciously, what they do day in and day out with chronic patients doesn't fit that model. And that adds a huge source of distress and burnout within the profession. I love that. 
it's such a it's such an important additional layer to the work that you're doing. That's awesome. As we're wrapping up today, I have to ask you for the way that you think about psychological strength. How would you characterize it within the context of the work that you do? What is what does psychological strength mean to you? I for me, psychological strength is almost a direct synonym to resilience. And you have to allow the world to break you in big ways and small ways and recover from that, just like you would build a muscle. And, and it's only, you know, I thought uh, this is a whole nother podcast, but I mean, I, I, I was, I, I was very fortunate and I thought the world had tested me and it had in some ways, but for many years, I didn't recognize the privilege that I'd had. And so when the world really did start testing me, I mean, it felt, it felt like the trials of Job. I mean, my MS took a, a really nasty turn. It was a right frontal temporal lesion. And you know what that can do. And, and I thought I had lost myself and I would not come back. And, I, you know, I was dealing with that in the midst of you know, my then wife who uh, was dying of cancer and uh, we were uh, doing it in, in the midst of being an entrepreneur and not having a, a steady safety net around us and having little kids and yada, yada, yada. And, you know, it just went on and on. And I was and, and then in the midst of all that, my dog died. I mean, I, I was broken completely broken. And so in many ways, I've embarked on the research that I have and on the path that I have, because first I had to learn how to fix myself and how to bring myself back to a life that I wanted to live. And I can't just do that for myself. I've, I've got to share those things with others as well. And I'm so glad you do. This has just been so wonderful. What an incredible, fortunate series of events between you finding a random photo of me on <laughs> Google to us connecting and discovering the parallel path that we're both on to bring this valuable information to a wider audience. I'm so grateful to have met you and I'm so grateful to have had you on. Um, you're welcome back at any point in time. Would love uh, to continue to help spread, you know, this message both, to, you know, to folks with chronic conditions and then just everybody else who just wants to live, uh, live well and live the best life that they can. So can't thank you enough for being on. This has just been a pleasure. Well, I, I truly appreciate it. Um, the book comes out on December 3rd, uh, Pre-sales are available about a month before that, um, you know, and I know you'll link mm -hmm. uh, the Chronic Cow website or they can go to my own website and, and uh, you know, I, if people have questions, please reach out. Don't, don't be shy. Uh, this is, you know, you and I do the things that we do because it's about helping people. And if, if, somebody else doesn't ask or raise their hand, I, I, you know, I can't be helpful because mm -hmm. I don't know about them yet. I love it. I love it. I'll second that. Do reach out to Kevin, to myself. If there's anything that has resonated with you on this episode that you think we can help with, we are definitely here. And that's why we do what we do. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you. It's a simple fact that nearly everyone in the world could benefit from building psychological strength, but not everyone will put in the time and effort to do so, but today you did. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Building Psychological Strength. Now, if you're interested in building the mental toughness, confidence, and resilience you need to thrive through life's ups and downs, visit us at www.peakmindpsychology.com. Also, if there's someone in your life who could benefit from this episode, please share it with them. And if you yourself found this episode valuable, meaning if you took away even one insight that you can use to build psychological strength in your own life, we would so appreciate it if you would drop us a rating and a review on iTunes. 
The thing is, the more ratings and reviews we have, the easier it is to get this powerful and important content out to the people who need to hear it. Remember, your mind can be your most valuable asset or your biggest liability, and you get to choose. So choose wisely, my friend. And I'll see you next time on Building Psychological Strength.